diving into this ARG, uh, I want to preface this by saying that this won't be a full deep dive or full analysis of the series. Um, rather, I really want to focus on why this series was so impactful for me and why this series unsettled me so deeply. In other words, I basically just want to focus on the things that it does right in terms of uh, horror, storytelling, tension buildup, atmosphere, and so on. Now, since I'm only going to be focusing on the main story points, um, there will be large portions of this ARG that I don't cover in this video. And that's because I want you guys to experience the horror for yourselves. Even if you don't find it particularly scary, I promise you the story will absolutely have you hooked. It, it's a marvelous show indeed. Uh, the link to the original playlist will be down below in the description as always. And uh, without wasting any more time, let's dive into the first investigation. October 14th, 2005. A post is made on a Half-Life 2 forum regarding a mysterious graffiti located in the Ravenholm map. Anyone see that weird graffiti in Ravenholm? It's in the beginning part in the dark alley part. Very creepy if you ask me. Is this a glitch or what? And when you walk up to it, there's a weird noise. Is this a G-Man? Oh, well, it, it's probably nothing, you know, I mean, Half-Life 2 is known for having a creepy vibe, so maybe it's just- OH MY FUCKING GOD, WHAT THE FUCK IS THAT SHIT?! Now, when the person behind this video, known as Anamide, uh, conducts his own investigation of the strange graffiti, uh, this is what he finds waiting for him in the Ravenholm map, as promised. Uh, while the image does share similarities with the, uh, regular Umbrella Man graffiti, this one is, uh, it's off. Let, let's just put it that way. Uh, its face is covered in shadow and adorned with two glowing white eyes. It's ominous. It gives the sense that we're all simultaneously being watched through the eyes of this picture. And of course, the empty and liminal scenery certainly doesn't help either, but we'll, we'll get into that later on in the video. Oh, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, the main protagonist begins to analyze the map file itself, where he discovers that the image is corrupted. To find out why, he investigates it further in a text editor. There he discovers a console command that he hasn't seen before. Unknown command interlope. Now, I do need to point out the very obvious warning here. Uh, the definition of interlope is as follows. Become involved in a place or situation where one is not wanted or is considered not to belong. So right away, whatever the fuck this umbrella man is, he's telling Anamide to piss off. I'm sorry, mister, but, but you don't want to be interloping with these hands. That's the correct usage of the word. Be quiet. Shut up. So like any good law-abiding citizen that has way too much time on his hands, uh, he decides to open up Half-Life 2 and uh, run this command in the console. Now, some of you guys at home might be asking yourselves, uh, what the fuck is going on? Why he do that? What? Why he do that, though? Well, <laughs> to explain in layman's terms, uh, what this command is doing is pulling random demos that were recorded in the game by other players. Now, what a demo is, is essentially, um, well, a recording, right? It's something that any player can create by simply typing in the record command in the console, and playing out the demo will essentially reenact anything that you recorded during your gameplay. And for some ungodly reason, this command can pull in hundreds of demos seemingly recorded by other players. And how it's doing this, well, I, I, I don't fucking know, okay? Just, just sit down and watch the video. Isn't that what you're here for, huh? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Start taking notes sweetie. And don't forget to eat your vegetables. In addition to generating the demo in-game, it also generates a file that can be shared and investigated further. Um, as you might have noticed uh, earlier, most of the demo clips that Anamide manages to find only last for a few seconds and show the character randomly just spinning around or 
hitting a wall or, or beating their meat. Uh, which I found really funny for some goddamn reason. I don't know why. It's just, why would you record this? I, I want to know, just for research purposes. Uh, others, of course, are just the characters spawning outside the map or aimlessly wandering around the game. Sometimes even a map file will actually generate with the demo, which allows Anabide to explore the map. Why, why would you do that? Oh, okay. You're trying to download malware at this point. Jesus. And guess what, guys? Guess what? <laughs> There's other games that are built on Source Engine 2. It's not just Half-Life 2, guys, believe it or not. I know, shocking. Uh, which means that this rabbit hole, it, it just got a whole lot deeper, quite frankly. Uh, Anamide decides to test out the command in other games like TF2 and CSS, and much to his sickening delight, oh, they do, they do yield fruitful results. I am sorry to say. Now at this point, I'm sure a lot of you guys are wondering, well, what's what's got you so excited about this, Soupy? I mean, this is about as interesting as a truck driver getting excited over the smell of gasoline. What what What's going on? Well, uh, that's because all of this seemingly unimportant filler information is build up. Build up for the horrors that are about to come next. 10 minutes into the first episode, something strange happens. We're shown a CSS demo that is completely unlike the rest. The player seems to be moving completely independent of its player model, almost like they're wearing a VR headset. Then one of the most ominous scenes in the entire series plays out, and I'm gonna let that part play out here. Now, before we get too much further into the series, I want to talk about Teletubbies for a second. <laughs> um, as a kid, there were very specific things about that TV show that uh, really used to bother me. One part in particular was this episode about a carousel in the sky. Um, at first, before the carousel even reaches the ground, all you see is this tiny little shape just spinning around in the sky, slowly coming closer and closer and closer. You don't know what it means. You don't know what it wants, but you bet your bottom dollar that it's coming. And this scene in particular with the Umbrella Man really reminded me of that carousel scene from Teletubbies for some reason. Um, and for future reference, we will be referring to demo recordings like this as type five demos for the rest of the video because Anamide thought it sounded cool. Uh, Anamide mentions there are other recordings like this spoken about on the Half-Life 2 forum. Uh, there's one called Spooky Coast and the other is called Misty, but conveniently enough, uh, they happen to be lost media. Damn, man, just stop edging us at this point, okay? Show us the fucking content. Quit making us wait. And that's actually the real horror of the series, by the way. He just keeps edging us over and over again, just keeping us on the edge of our seats. It's fucking awful. Uh, moving along here, Anamide mentions that he managed to find another Type 5 demo in his search. This is what happens in that demo.
doesn't that just put like a sour taste in your mouth? Like, like, doesn't that make you feel like you just ate the seafood salad at Golden Corral and now you have to take a fat shit? Suddenly, tragedy strikes. At exactly 6 a.m., the command stops working. They were on to him this whole time, apparently, um, and we were none the wiser. And even worse, the Umbrella Man from Ravenholm is gone! Right as Anamide was about to leave us edging once again, uh, he announces that he finally located the lost Spooky Coast video. Have a watch. Doesn't this make you want to sit down and play a nice old game of Half-Life 2? Huh? Or, or maybe Gmod? Yeah? You, you want to play Gmod? Like a big boy now? Is that it? Oh no. He's back. Almost a year later, our good friend Anamide returns to us, serving up a nice slice of oh shit, Mary Poppins ain't looking too good. As soon as the graffiti reappears, the commands also start to work again. Now through some little source engine magic here that I don't feel like explaining in any amount of detail of, Anamide learns that from the time the commands start working, he has approximately five hours to get all the demos that his little heart desires. It's crunch time, baby. To make the most of his limited time, Anamide decides to start testing out different games. He starts off with Half-Life 2, Episode 2, CSGO, Day of Defeat, and Dota 2. Interestingly, however, things don't start to pick up the pace until he opens up Portal. During the last few seconds of his five hour window, he manages to get another Type 5 demo. Immediately after starting up the demo, he notices that something is off. Out of nowhere, the server seemingly disconnects and Anamide is able to navigate around the demo freely. One thing that Anamide and one of his friends, who I'm assuming he's on a call with, uh, takes note of here is the fact that the chamber looks off right? Uh, it doesn't normally look like this in the game at all. No, in fact, it's quite dark. Anamide continues to explore around the game map before one of his friends suggests looking for different triggers in the game. Anamide pauses the game to open up the console when something happens that shouldn't even be possible. It's like show trigger toggle. Whatever this entity is, it completely fricked the fuck out of his game for real. No cap. Uh, every time he opens up Portal, it, it just spawns him in a dark room now, with a checkerboard floor and a red light. Now by now, a lot has happened in between episodes. Uh, to give you a disgustingly short summarization of events, the Anomaday team found a way to explore the void outside of the game maps for both uh, GM Construct, this map in TF2 that I don't know the name of, and Portal. And in doing so, they were able to find these um, mysterious, seemingly man-made structures hidden way out in the darkness. And at this point, they're still trying to figure out what all of it means. Uh, they also managed to find the Lost Misty Type 5 demo in the form of a video. Now, I'm not going to be going over all of this 
here because if I do, this video will end up being two hours long. And believe me, I know as well as anyone that nobody here wants to listen to me run my mouth for more than 25 minutes. Instead, I want to focus on part eight in the series the Tuesday incident. Anamide starts by running a test stream where he plays a few games and answers some questions. Suddenly, a duty calls and he's needed back in the office, so he has to end his stream a bit early. Of course, in typical haunted video game ARG fashion, he forgets to turn his stream off and leaves it running. Now off camera, him and his team set up uh, two pieces of software that run in the background and essentially analyze all of the Source Engine games for them automatically. Uh, so one of these programs called Raven Check, for example, was designed to start running automatically every night at 12 a.m. So that's exactly what it does while on stream. In doing so, it actually finds something. Well, look who finally decided to clock in. Uh, similarly, another program called Skybox also runs in the background. All this program does is run a bunch of Source Engine games at the same time. Don't, don't fucking ask me how that works, I, I don't know. Okay, it, it, it just does. And it automatically types the secret command in all of the consoles on every game. It does this shit for a fat minute until it finally manages to generate another Type 5 demo in Half-Life 2. It starts off with the player finding themselves alone on a grassy beach. Apart from a few random pieces of furniture scattered about, the beach is empty and the player is completely alone. The player starts to walk closer to the water when suddenly a familiar foe appears in the distance. It stands completely motionless for a very uncomfortable amount of time just staring at the player. Now, I'm pretty sure this was coming from the player model, but the whole time the player starts randomly triggering a voice cue where it repeatedly says hi. Try as he might, the poor fella can't seem to get the interloper to say hi back, but he never gives up now. Our old friend never gives up. Finally, a miracle takes place. An old radio falls out of the sky and starts to play a wacky tune. The character is delighted to have finally won the interloper's approval and begins to dance like a magical forest creature. And then once again, he does this for an uncomfortable amount of time until the interloper has finally had enough of his bullshit. Hi. 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 You know, I thought we had something, interloper. Thought we had a connection, but I guess I was wrong, wasn't I? Also in this video, uh, when Anamide returns to find all the carnage on his PC and opens up TF2, this funny fella shows up, and I, I don't know why my caveman brain found this so fucking funny. Uh, maybe it's because I see myself in him, you know, I mean, I mean, look, he even has a scoliosis, just like me, I mean, he, he's just like me for real. Now, at this point, again, I don't care to do a full-fledged uh, deep dive on this series and then cracking open the files and down downloading Russian spyware on my computer, as I normally do on this channel, right? Because quite frankly, you would literally have to be a psychopath to sit here and watch a two hour long soupy soup video. So we're not going to do that. No, 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 not at all. Um, uh, I really just want to focus on why this series deeply unsettled me. And I, I don't quite know how to explain it, but it's like it unlocked uh, some sort of core memory for me that I tried so hard to forget. And it's just like, no, go back. Go back, please. Rebury. Rebury. Now, the fact that the interloper doesn't immediately try to uh, jump scare you or chase you down Five Nights at Freddy's style is the most unsettling aspect of the series to me. Um, at first, it just kind of sits there lingering in the distance, almost, you know, sizing you up and down, much like a predatory creature would, right? It's looking at you like you're some sort of little bug or something. I don't like it. It makes me feel 
kind of gross, really. And and that, for some reason, makes it seem more intelligent, in a way. Uh, what also doesn't help is the fact that for the majority of the series, nothing major happens. Uh, it's just a group of people fucking up the games on their PCs and speaking in technological terms that are way over my head which by itself is already pretty frightening. But regardless, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that most of the series is just build up. I mean, yes, you're on the edge of your seat, but you're also not entirely expecting anything to happen at the same time. And when it does, it's like, oh, oh, oh no, there, it's, there he is, he's interloping again. And this to me, makes the whole series feel a lot more real and believable. It's like these people are trying to hunt something down that somehow keeps uh, evading their efforts entirely. Now, as I mentioned previously in the video, uh, this particular form of horror is not something that's new to me at all. It's actually something I, for some reason, had when I was a very young child. If you guys remember where I was talking about that episode of Teletubbies, yeah, I, I know, of all things, why Teletubbies? Yeah, I know. Shut the fuck up, okay? I'm getting somewhere with this. I guess that's just further confirmation that this is just a fear that I've always had from day one for some reason, and for some reason, right? This oddly specific fear of things slowly stalking you from a distance and then pouncing on you when it's too late for you to react, you know, like, and then you have to ask yourself, why would anyone have such an oddly specific fear as a child? And I genuinely don't have a good answer for that. I, I don't fucking know. <laughs> um, perhaps it's some remnant from a, a time long ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, where our ancestors were climbing trees and hunting down Teletubbies for a living. I don't, I don't fucking know. Do, do I look like a historian to you? Do I look well-educated to you? Of course not. So there's that. Um, there's the unpredictable and uncanny nature of the interloper. It's not knowing what his intentions are. That's fear number one. Also, it's the fact that, you know, it has this seemingly supernatural ability to move in the game when the game is paused, which indicates to me some sort of uh, sinister intent going on, or maybe I'm reading into that too deeply. Now let's talk a little bit more about um, the Source Engine games themselves, uh, specifically Half-Life 2 and Gmod. Now I've been a Gmod player since, um, I wanna say late 2018, uh, so, so really not that long actually. I, I only got around to playing it when I was around 16. So I don't have a whole lot of uh, lore or, or deep nostalgia attached to the game. So now I have to ask myself this question. Why the fuck do the Half-Life 2 and Gmod maps creep me out so much, and why do they feel so hauntingly nostalgic to me? Uh, and here is where I want to point out the obvious. Liminality. We're using big boy words now, okay? Keep up with me here. To define what liminality is, it is the following. Number one, occupying a position at or on both sides of a boundary or threshold. Number two, uh, relating to a transitional or initial stage of a process. Well, that doesn't really get us any closer to understanding why these maps are so scary. So let's get more specific. Picture this. You're in an old apartment building, one that hasn't been renovated since 1992. Apart from the faint hum of someone's TV or the smell of dinner cooking, uh, there, there's no one in the hallway with you. It's empty, leaving you completely alone. At the end of the hallway is an elevator, an elevator that also hasn't been renovated since 1992. Uh-oh, uh, your lazy ass doesn't feel like taking the stairs, so you decide that taking the creepy elevator is the best course of action. You step inside the elevator, and it smells vaguely familiar, but you can't quite put your finger on the smell. The smell is like a mixture of old carpet and cigarette smoke. You press the ground level button and you feel the elevator start to creak as it makes its way to the bottom. Now this feeling, you've had it before. It's like a slight sense of unease or perhaps isolation. Even though there's no immediate danger in sight, the uncertainty of what's beyond the elevator door and the lack of other people sends a shiver up your spine. Now, if you picked up on it, both the elevator and the hallway are considered liminal spaces, or in other words, a transitional space leading from one point to the other. A space that exists in between. So they're not designed 
for you to linger for long, right? Or for you to even fully process their existence. They exist solely to transfer you over to the next stage. So in a sense, you know deep down that you're not meant to stay. You're only meant to stay just for a moment. And that's exactly how I would describe maps like Ravenholm on Half-Life 2 and GM Construct on Gmod. These are not places meant to house any form of life for long periods of time. In fact, they exist for another purpose entirely, hence why they feel so abandoned. Even though you know people have been there before you, it's definitely hinted at, but they're not there, it's empty and you're alone nonetheless. This is where that sinking feeling of dread comes from, at least in my opinion. And I, I don't know what it is, but this series captured that feeling so well for me. What makes it even more unsettling is that these places are meant to be completely empty. So the fact that there's some living, breathing entity actively hunting you down at all times is just is so frightening to me. And I know that this is only one of many uh, Gmod and Source Engine ARGs, so if you guys wanna see, I guess, a longer video on this one or maybe another video on some other ARGs, feel free to leave a comment down below. Let me know your thoughts on that. And at some point during this channel's growth, maybe a little bit closer to 100,000 subscribers, if we... Oof we can get there, that is, uh, I might actually go outside and actively seek out these types of liminal spaces and maybe film a couple of videos out there in the real world. Wow, Soupy goes outside? Shocking. Like, she would never do that. That's that's just wild. Uh, not too sure how you guys would feel about that idea, but uh, yeah, definitely let me know in the comments below. And uh, let me know what you think about this, this little series as well. And as always, thanks for watching.